you please state your name and the branch of service? Yep. My name is Nick Jones. I served in the United States Air Force for six years from 1999 to 2005. I was a staff sergeant in the Air Force. Where did you serve? So uh, my duty location after basic training in tech school uh, was in Sumter, South Carolina at Shaw Air Force Base. I, I was stationed there for all my six years uh, during, the, during my time, but I also traveled to about 30 countries while I was in doing work in U.S. embassies overseas on their tactical radios. Wow. Um, we'll definitely want to talk about that. Um, why did you decide that you wanted to join the military? So um, I didn't, I don't know at first. I, uh, when I got out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. School wasn't always easy for me. Um, I was smart, but I wasn't uh, motivated, I would say. So uh, after about a, a year, year and a half break after high school, uh, I decided I needed to do something. And so I decided to join the Air Force. My grandpa was a Marine and my grandpa, other grandpa was in the Army. Um, I just always heard, well, I'll join the Air Force if you're gonna, gonna do it. So I guess I got in that line at the recruiter's office. Perfect. Um, do you remember what your, do you recall what your first days of service felt like? Yes. Um, so as soon as you leave MEPS, I enlisted in Wisconsin. Uh, so I left MEPS in Milwaukee. The MEPS? MEPS is the Military Entrance Processing something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically where everybody goes to for your entry process, you know, where you, you uh, ship off from. Is it different than basic training? Yes. Okay. It's, it's basically your, just your military, like they do all the physicals, all the paperwork. Oh, I understand. And then you, you go there and then, and then they give you your plane ticket and you're out. Um, but my first couple days, I mean, it's kind of a whirlwind. You show up at uh, the airport in San Antonio. You, they have a special area for all the new recruits. You go there and you immediately start getting the drill sergeant uh, time. Um, and, and it's a whirlwind. The first day feels like a week. You know, you, I remember standing in the sun still in my civilian clothes, being like, oh my gosh, have I been here like three weeks? And it, and it was still the same day. Because you get there about midnight, one in the morning, um, and it's, it's just a whirlwind from there. Mm -hmm. And that was boot camp? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is one thing from boot camp that you'll never forget? Um, I'll never forget, you know, the people you meet because you're kind of going through this weird experience together. Um, and you come from all walks of life. You get to know people really quickly. Uh, you get to know their sleep habits their, <laughs> and all, the, all those things. So the memories are, you know, I'll never forget. Even if I haven't maintained contact with people I was in boot camp with, you always have these memories of the things you accomplished together while you're in boot camp. Right. Um, what is one story that you seem to tell people from that time over and over? From boot camp or yes. in general? Please. No, boot camp. Uh, boot camp is the, I mean, you always remember kind of the first meal, which is pretty much a 10 second meal. <laughs> um, they fill your plate up. You got to down three glasses of water, and by the time you do that, they're pushing you out of there. That and uh, your first shower is interesting. It's like 18 seconds, three seconds per shower head. Um, so just some of those things, those initial things. But um, you know, looking back, you can you look at the first days compared to the last days, and how much you really you grow. In, mm -hmm. in when I was in, it was only six weeks for boot camp. I think it's at eight now for the Air Force. But you know, it's it's amazing how much change can occur in six weeks. Um, was it a bit of culture shock? Uh, kind of. I mean, I grew up in a pretty um, regimented home, okay. <laughs> so it wasn't, I mean, it was different, but, um, and we didn't have like YouTube and stuff to watch mm -hmm. videos. You know, now you can watch videos of boot camp to get a taste of it, but um, I was always, always grew up around um, different people and, and different cultures, so it wasn't necessarily that. Um, I guess I would say it's just different. Okay. Um, what was your favorite food from the mess hall? Favorite food? Um, it was, I don't know what it was about the, you know, it was the Air Force, so the other veterans on this will probably um, laugh, but it, like there was the ch whatever chocolate cereal was in the thing. For some, you know, you didn't eat a lot of chocolate, so for some reason those tasted the best. 
But if you had a lot of courage, um, you'd go try to get like a piece of cake or something, and it'd be on one of the, like this display spindle with a glowing light on it. But it was right by all the all the TIs, so you'd have to like stand there at attention with a piece of pie in your hand and answer some trivia fact about the Air Force in order to get the cake. So. Love it. Um, so when you did serve, where were you first deployed? So deployed, uh, the first time I truly deployed was um, to Prince Sultan Air Base in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I was there for two months building a communication center for the base. Uh, that was actually about six months prior to 9-11. Uh, so that was one of my longest deployments I had. Otherwise, I had kind of a unique job in which I would travel for a couple weeks at a time every quarter to multiple embassies over in the Middle East and Africa, um, some Europe, uh, working on radios and doing training for the embassy staff. Um, when you first got to Saudi Arabia, do you remember arriving and what it felt like? Yep. Um, so when, when you land, I mean, it's, a, it, it's the desert. Uh, the one thing I always remember, you get off the plane, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with camel spiders, but they're these ginormous spiders over in the desert. How big and, are we talking? Uh, mm, but they, they can get pretty big. Oh, wow. And they're pretty aggressive, so, you know, they'll kind of chase you down the flight line. Um, so that, you know, you land, you're in the desert, you got alien spiders attacking you. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, can you tell me more specifically about being a communication specialist mm -hmm. that you um, really, what your job entailed? Mm -hmm. So if I would say what, what you're trained for is pretty much if you watch a movie with somebody with a radio on their back, that, that's what I did. Um, or like the equivalent of kind of like a dispatcher uh, would in the civilian world. I never actually did my job in that context because I was stationed in, in South Carolina. I was in a tactical squadron. So we were always prepared. We wore desert camouflage all the time um, because our area of responsibility was Saudi Arabia. So um, my job was really setting up tactical communication systems, uh, high frequency antennas, satellite communications. Um, so I didn't perform as like a dispatcher ever, but um, basically I supported the systems. Like if all communication was down, that was your link back to the states. Um, before we move on to the next question, can you tell me what it was like to be in the military during 9-11? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that was a, when I enlisted, it was relative peacetime. So, let's see, I enlisted in 99, and then 9-11 happened, you know, late 2001. Uh, it was different. I mean, we didn't have the phones and notifications like we did. I mean, I just remember not, no, the cell phones not working because all the, all the lines were jammed because everybody was calling. Uh, we, we put on the news at the time and you know we'd heard something had happened and then you put the news on and then you see another thing happen. And that night we're packing pallets to deploy to Afghanistan. Uh, I, I didn't go, our unit ended up not going, but I mean, it was pretty real. You know, you're, you're just packing pallets that night because of, well, we had go bags at all times ready. That might've been what happened. So where were you at that time? I was in Shaw, at Shaw Air Force Base in you South were, Carolina. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, what did your service look like after, shortly after 9-11? Did any of it change? Uh, for sure. I mean, for a long time, the bases were locked up way tighter than they were. Uh, it was, you know, more stringent getting around. You were on high alert all the time. I continued to travel. Um, in my particular role, I traveled not as a civilian, but I wore civilian clothes, flew on civilian airlines, and navigated uh, different countries. It, it was different for a while. Um, I remember going to Egypt one time, and you're out in the streets in Egypt, and you know people wanting to engage about things about about the war and the players involved at the time. And I mean, it was a maybe I was young and naive, uh, you know, it wasn't a normal time, but it wasn't, looking back on it now, I realize how anxious of, 
anxious of a time that was. Um, with your position, did you interact with a lot of the citizens when you're in the foreign mm -hmm. countries? Okay. Yep. So I, I mean, I would travel, you know, and live on the economy in whatever country I would I would go to. So I'd I'd be in each country for probably three to five days at a time. So after your work during the day, it's you know you're on the economy, going out to dinner like everybody else, and um, and that really shaped my worldview of you know a lot of we're all really tr working for the same things for happiness, health, family. Um, and, and when you're able to interact with other people from different countries in that way and different cultures, you realize how more similar we are than different. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about a couple of your most memorable experiences? So, I, I mean, the, the Air Force was great for me. It, it, I got to grow up a little bit. I, I got to meet people that I'm still close with to this day. Uh, my experience, I, I'm very fortunate. My brother was in the Air Force as well, um, but he was a helicopter crew chief and on a flight line in Iraq multiple times. I traveled in civilian airlines and stayed in hotels and lived off the economy in different places. So, I mean, my member, I, I got to tour the world and, and see things I will never probably be able to see again uh, because of that. You know, been to the pyramids, I've been to Petra and Jordan, you know, been to Nairobi, been on safaris. You know, and we were work. You know, I was working. You know, but I, I was very fortunate to be able to do the other things that I was able to do as well. Um, what was one of your? You had to go back as mm -hmm. more of a tourist. What would be a place you'd go back to? Um, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Really? Yeah, it, that was. I would love to spend more time there, and you know, it's just north of Italy. It's a just a neat historic place. Had a met some really awesome people. I worked with the Slovenian Special Forces there um, for some tactical uh, communication systems work. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, it was weird talking to their military personnel's experience compared to ours. You know, they have mandatory, you have to serve X amount of years uh, when you become an adult over there, um, not paid well, accommodations aren't the greatest. And, I, can't, I, can't, I felt spoiled because, you know, the Air Force really took care of us, and, and yeah. Um, when your service ended, mm -hmm. what did you do in the days and weeks afterward? Tried to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up still. <laughs> um, I wanted to cross-train into to be in air, air traffic control. At the time, I couldn't get released from my career fields because they needed staff sergeants at that time in my career field. So I knew I didn't want to be a dispatcher. What I was doing didn't necessarily translate real great to the civilian world. So I'm like, well, I can't cross train. I guess I'll get out. I got out after six years. And, you know, you go through all these briefings about, like, transition and getting out of the military. And you're like, yeah, whatever, I'll be fine. And I wasn't fine for a while. Like, it was a, a different world. You're used to the structure, and they let you know when your appointments are, you know where your meals are coming from, you know how your housing is taken care of. And it was, it was hard for a couple of years for me because um, I, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, luckily, I kind of I lived as a civilian for a little bit and realized I better get my stuff together <laughs> and, and, and go back to school. Um. Was there anything that helped you transition? Uh, my my grandparents were 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 a big support for me when I came home from South Carolina. I visited them, and they're like, "Well, you know, Nick, you're closer to thirty than you are twenty. You might want to think about stuff." And they, but they really supported me, you know, getting me some career counseling and 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 some connections to to figure out what I want. And then also uh, my wife. I met my wife and. Uh, we kind of motivated each other to, to grow. That's wonderful. Um, what were some of the things that you're most looking forward to when your service ended? Um, you know, you think you're looking forward to the freedom, like, oh, I can do whatever I want. No one's telling me what to do. And I'll be real, I kind of missed that. <laughs> I, I missed um, some of the guardrails. Uh, I'm glad I had those guardrails up in my late teens, early 20s, uh, because 
sometimes you can make bad choices in your late teens and early 20s and having those guardrails were good. So when I got out and not having that anymore, you're like, woohoo. And um, it, it just took a minute. Yeah. Um, what were you most hesitant about? Would it be the, that lack of structure? Uh, the lack of structure, the, I think you really realize how big your benefit package is <laughs> when you're in the service. I mean, you don't ever think about paying a medical bill. You don't think about if you, I didn't have children at the time, but like if we had a kid, it probably cost like eight bucks. You know, you don't, I guess you don't think of the benefits. Um, but um, I, I, I wouldn't change it. You know, I would have retired in, if I would have stayed in, I would have retired in 2019. And you think about it like, oh man, but I have accomplished and, and done some really awesome things since. Um, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the general military? Um, growing up, we, I didn't know much about, we didn't have a base around us or anything. So, and what you knew about war, you knew from TV or I didn't play video games. Like, you know, it, it's different when you're, you know, I was not directly on front lines, but I supported missions where people were killed. And I mean, that's, that's enough to just know that you're partaking in those things. Uh, and it's a struggle, but it's not like what's portrayed on TV. It's not like what's portrayed in, in video games. Um, you know, knowing that things you're doing are causing people to lose life, it's hard to wrestle with sometimes. Um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? Um, immensely. I was, you know, I was told in high school I wouldn't, I wasn't college material and I wasn't going to go to college or anything. So, um, I didn't really believe in myself. I didn't have much confidence when I got out of high school. And because of my military experience, I, I gained confidence and grew up really quick. And I was able to, because of the military, I was able to go to college, be successful, get post-bachelor degree, and, and have a career that I love and that I'm very thankful for. Um, how would your service, how did your service affect your career in education? It made it much easier to become an educator. Um, my, I, I was fortunate to have the GI Bill as a Wisconsin um, veteran. I, I have the Wisconsin GI Bill that helps support any ongoing education for myself and my family. Um, I'm, I'm extremely blessed for the, the benefits I've, I've been afforded for that, that brief time of service. You know, when you sign up, six years feels like forever, but I, I've been out more than double the amount of time I was in. So it, it stand out. Are you involved in any of the or the VFW or Legion community here? No, uh, and it's funny because I, I think I connected with Rob over email, and I, I'd like to be involved with something. When I was uh, one of my um, duties when I was in the service, I was on the our base honor guard performing military honors for veterans. Um, we had a couple active duty funerals, uh, but doing the casket carrying and flag folding and things like that. So I. I'd like to be involved with something like that because that was a really important time for me to to show reverence and respect for for our veterans. Um, is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? No, I don't think so. I, I had a very fortunate experience, and some veterans' experiences aren't like mine. They're much different. Uh, if my brother were here, um, he's not with us anymore. But if he were here, he probably would have a different take on his experience in the military. Um, but I'm very blessed. I'm thankful that I was able to serve. I, I, when you sign up, you, you know that there's a potential for things to happen. But I'm fortunate to serve. I'm, it makes me thankful for where I live and what I have. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm.